Father, we just come to you today, and Lord, uh, today is not going to be a polished sermon. This is a classroom. And so, Lord, we just ask that if there's anyone here with questions, that they don't understand something, that they raise their hand, that we make sure that we don't move forward without the discussion, so that when we leave here today, we can accomplish the goal of what we want you to share with us, which is what is the gospel? And so be with us as we learn what your gospel is. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, uh, so we are in the book of John. Uh, this is our fifth, uh, fifth week in the book of John, and we are at verse 6 through 8. So yes, uh, we still may be here for a while. Uh, but there's a lot of good stuff that we're learning and today we're introduced to a new character, and um, I thought it was best to introduce the character and then uh, share what he has to say from a different location. And so uh, the word of the day here is verses 6 through 8, and we're going to read that. And it says, A man came, one sent from God, and his name was John. Now this is John the Baptist. He came as a witness to testify about the light, so that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but he came to testify about the light. Bless the word of the Lord. Now, last week we spent time talking about the light, uh, which we were talking about this grand term called logos. So, can anyone tell me what light is. Jesus. Okay? Jesus is part of the light. What is light? The Word. Yep, the Word of God, the Bible, that is light. Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit, that's part of light. Is there anything else part of light? The Word. God. What? God. Yep, God is part of the light. Okay, so this light term is just another one of the many ways in Scripture that we talk about this all-inclusive holiness of God. Uh, and, and that's what we have to start thinking about God as, as this Logos term. is is just this ball of God with no end. Okay? There's no part of God that's more holy than another. He doesn't have a smelly part and a clean part. He's all the same, all the way through. Perfect and holy. And, and part of the way to describe that is light. And what does light contrast with? Darkness. So wherever we find light, we find life. And wherever we find darkness, what do you think we find there? Death. What do you got? Death. Death. All right. Okay, so now, when it's talking about this, we just got done talking about how God, Jesus, is light. So it says, a man came, one sent from God, his name was John. He came as a witness to testify about the light. All right. Now, who here has ever testified before in a court? Have you done that before? For a job. For a job. Yeah, right? That would be interesting. Okay, um, when you testify, do you just make stuff up? No, you can't when you're testifying. In order to testify, you have to have real experience to be able to talk about it. Okay, and so what, what John the Baptist is doing here is he came as a witness to testify about the light. Now the cool part about that is if he's going to testify about the light, he's not going to be talking about something he has no idea about. Okay, He's going to be talking about something that he has already experienced. And that's important. Okay, um, So he was not the light, but he came to testify about the light. The light. And that light is the gospel. So, the question today is what is the gospel? So we're going to take a moment 
And I want you to write down, if you have a piece of paper, if you're taking notes, or in your mind, I want you to write down what the gospel is for you. And this is important because when we're learning something that's so important as what the gospel is, a really good teaching technique is for you to write down what you know and then to be able to contrast it at the end with what you've learned to see if it's changed what you do. Does that make sense? All right, so I'm going to give you about a minute and a half here. Uh, feel free if anyone needs to share a piece of paper. There's pens in the back. I've got the pens back there. And you can do shorthand. You can just write your thoughts. But I want you to be able to write down in your mind what is the gospel. All right, so let's take a couple minutes to do that. All right. Every Christian, no matter the age, should be able to answer this question with confidence. Yeah, when I went to Bible college, they would say, you have to answer this question in a 30-second elevator ride. So by the time you get in the elevator with someone, you have 30 seconds to share it. Uh, and it, it can be that short. It doesn't have to be this eloquent presentation. Uh, and we're going to help you do that as well. So why is it important to be able to effectively share the correct gospel with others? What are your thoughts? <clears throat> to bring others to Christ. To bring others to Christ? Correctly. Correctly? <laughs> is it okay to, to share a different gospel? What happens when we share a different gospel? You know, it misleads, right? I, I've heard people share the gospel like this. Oh, you've got cancer. I'm so sorry. You know what? If you believe in Christ and you come to our church, we're going to lay our hands on you. And he's going to heal you of all your diseases and give you a Lamborghini. <laughs> right? You know what I mean? That's called prosperity gospel. Is that what the Bible says? Is that what 1 Peter says? That we're going to have peaches and roses all of our life as Christians? No. no it, says, it says Christ suffered because the world can't accept him. And you are now of Christ. They're not going to be able to accept you. And you are going to suffer in this life. And the suffering that you do in this life will make you perfect. Just as it made Christ perfect through suffering. Okay? Um, so we need to be able to share the right gospel because, um, well, we're going to get to that. All right. The broken gospel. Do you know that there's a broken gospel out there? There's a lot of broken, fake, powerless gospels. There's a rat god. There's a rat god? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that probably wouldn't be the right gospel. All right. So, and here's the important part of it, okay? A powerless church shares a powerless gospel. And that's one of the main problems that we find in the American church today. Um, when you don't share the correct gospel, it leads to a powerless gospel. There's no power in it. There's no transformation. Now, God can still work through a broken gospel presentation because all of us interact with God directly in different ways. But in many ways, people are given a broken gospel. Okay, Many share a gospel of information rather than a gospel of power. Okay? What do you think that means? What's a gospel of information instead of a gospel of power? Go ahead. You can. I'd say we have experienced that. You know, just like so amazing information, and like it is truth, and you're reading the truth, and we've been studying all this power in the written word, right? But like, like the activation of it, right? Like what that really means, and truly knowing Jesus, like. You can have all the knowledge and you know, every word of the Bible, but if you don't know how to apply it, 
and trust in Jesus fully, like, it just, it was, it was so frustrating. I felt so frustrated. Like, I just know there's more of life. That's right. Like, you can have hope even when you're hurting. Like, you know, yeah. Well, that's, I remember Paul was writing about love. And the, the Holy Spirit interacts with all of us right now because we've all been given access to the Holy Spirit. Even if we're unsaved, we're, we're given access to interact with the Holy Spirit. Okay? And Paul was writing, and he was saying, if you have faith to move mountains, but you don't have love, it's, it's empty and void. If, if, if you're prophesying, if you're getting things from the Lord, and the Holy Spirit's giving you to prophesy great things, but you don't have love, you're worthless. You know? And, and so love is, is basically... You're absorbing that holiness. Love is reflecting it out to others. You know, and so we don't have eternal life just because we receive the holiness and love of God. We have eternal life because it's flowing through us. Uh, I like to think of it as when love stops, it dies. You know, if if you know, if the talent has been given to you, if you're not investing that talent for the Father. You're burying it in the ground. When he comes back and he says, what did you do with that talent? You say, I didn't do anything with it. It's a really good talent. Here you go. He's not going to be happy. Okay? And so that's a broken gospel. A gospel of information. So this is important because this is the gospel that we've been trained in Sunday school to teach. Okay? The things that Jesus did are not the gospel. And that's one of the, the main things that I want you to take away from this today. Okay? The things that Jesus did are not the gospel. The gospel is not the birth, the life, the death, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That is called the plan of redemption. And that uh, God completed that for us to receive the gospel. Okay? Um, so who has ever received a package in the mail before, like a really good present? Okay? Now, we know the present's coming. Do you care how that package was put together and packaged with tape? Do you care how it got to the shipping area and who picked it up and how and how long it was in the airplane before it got and put back in the truck and the character of the guy who was driving the mail truck to you and then as he walked, are you worried about how he walks, uh, how long his hair is, when he drops off, is he a nice guy? Are, are those the things that we're worried about when we're getting our package? No. What, what are we excited about? The package. We're excited about the package, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, so I, I really want you to get this. The things that Jesus did to help us get the gospel, that's called the plan of redemption. Okay? And when we're sharing the gospel, we can talk about those things, but we have to understand that that in itself is not the gospel itself. Okay? Now, if those are the things that you wrote down on your paper, that is part of the powerless gospel. It doesn't mean that you're bad or wrong. Okay? But what we want to do is we want to teach you to share the gospel that has power, the actual gospel message. Because that is the thing that transforms people's hearts. Can you imagine getting in an elevator and you have 30 seconds to share the hope of God, okay? Or even a minute, right? And, and well, actually, 30 seconds is better, right? So picture this. There's this guy. He's just broken. Uh, something bad just happened to him. And you get in there and you get in the elevator and you push the button and he just says, why are you so happy all the time when I see you? I'm just defeated, right? And you turn and you say this. Well, let me tell you about it. Whew, man, 
God created the world, and uh, Adam and Eve, they sinned, and we were perfect, but then we fell, and then, oh man, everything was messed up, and we were going to die, because we have sin, and sin equals death, and then so God had this guy named Jesus, and Jesus was God, and oh, that's really confusing, uh, but then uh, Jesus came as a virgin, and uh, he did all these really cool things, he was really smart, and then he healed a bunch of people, and he had disciples, and uh, then he, he was crucified on a cross. Crucifixion was really bad, he didn't want to do that. And because of that, his blood cleanses us from all sins, and after that, he rose on the third day, and now he ascended to heaven, and he sits at the right hand of God the Father, and if you believe in him, you will go to heaven. What do you say? <laughs> Can you see how that is a powerless gospel? That that's knowledge about the plan of redemption. Okay. All right. The path the messenger takes to deliver the message can never be more important than the message itself. So, we're about to look at the actual gospel message. Are you ready? Yes. Good. Alright. So, write this down. Oh, first, before we get there. We need to change our perspective about what the gospel is. It is more about logos than a logical set of events. Okay? Alright, here we go. What is the gospel? Here it is in sentence form. This was the message that God waited 400 years to give. The world was silent from God for 400 years. John the Baptist went out into the river, raised his hands, and he said this message. This is the gospel message. Uh, as you understand it, you'll know more why it's the gospel message. Uh, the message is repent for the kingdom of heaven is near. Who said it? John the Baptist said it in Matthew 3, verse 2. Uh, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, I think he probably says it to all of them. But well, I know he says it in Matthew. And then Jesus Christ says it in Matthew chapter 4, verse 17. So here's the interesting thing. John goes out, walks into the river, raises his hands, says, repent for the kingdom of heaven is near. Then Jesus comes to him. He gets baptized. The Holy Spirit comes and rests on Jesus. Then Jesus goes out and gets tempted in the desert. After he gets tempted in the desert, he goes out on the road and he raises his hand. And what does he say? That's right. He says the exact same phrase. In fact, in both verses, it is the exact same phrase. This is the gospel message. And so we have to understand what it means. All right? So uh, we get that first term, which is repent. Who here likes that term? No one likes that term. <laughs> repent. Okay, whenever we think of that, you know, we think of the fiery preacher that's just looking at everyone and he's like, repent, you sinners. And everyone's quaking in fear and, and uh, they've all been bad some, somehow and they feel shame, right? It, it's that shaking your finger like, you've done something wrong, repent. Okay? What you have to realize is that's not what that term really meant back then. Okay? Uh, in the original language, it's a compound verb uh, that means to think differently after. To think differently after. Or an afterthought. So you were thinking one way. Now you've had a change of heart. And now you're thinking a different way. <coughs> and so really what repent means is he's raising his hands and he's saying, prepare for a new concept or idea. There's something that I'm about to gonna say that's gonna shake the foundation of your faith. 
Okay? Prepare. So what's the rest of the message? For the kingdom of heaven. And the easiest way to describe this is that this is the place where God dwells. Wherever the kingdom of God is, there, or he's there. It's his kingdom. He's going to be there. Okay? So we have prepare for a new idea. The place where God dwells is what? It's near. It's at hand. Okay? Now this near is not a period of time. The way that this near is translated is a distance. Okay? So the Lord, the kingdom, or so God, He is not far away. He is near. Physically close. Now, why would this be good news? Well, we can go back to Adam and Eve. And who remembered uh, before the fall, uh, what were some of the perks that Adam and Eve got uh, in the Garden of Eden? What do you got, Todd? They got to walk with God. They got to walk with God in the cool of the evening. Now, wouldn't that be awesome? Okay? Can man stand in front of a living God right now? No. We can't because we have a little bit of evil in us, okay? And light crushes darkness. I mean, it just destroys it, okay? And so Adam and Eve have, had no darkness at one point. There was no sin. And they were able to walk with God in the evening. And they probably talked about the Mandalorian. <laughs> Okay? They had communion with God. Okay? But something sin came into their life and there was a penalty for that. What was the penalty for that? What was it? Death. Death. Death and darkness. Now, if we are in darkness, how much light is in us? Zero. Zero light. If we're living in darkness, there's zero light. Because light and darkness can't be in the same spot. And so what happened was, God had mercy on those living in darkness in the garden. And it, instead of destroying them, he made a plan of redemption. Do you know that the first animal to ever die was probably a lamb that was slain? And that lamb was given to cover Adam and Eve. I said it was a cow. Well, it could have been a cow. It doesn't say what animal it was, but I would probably say it would probably be a lamb. <laughs> so, okay? Um, and that was the first plan of redemption where an animal, the blood was spilled. The first animal was killed to cover the sin of Adam and Eve. And what did God do to them? Did he let them stay in the garden where all the light was? No. He kicked them out. Okay? And so what we have here, the rest of the Bible in the Old Testament, is we have a, a people that are living in darkness. They're separated from God. And God called out Abraham and said, you are going to be my representation, your nation are going to be my chosen people. And so he started to interact with the nation of Israel. But could he show his face to them? He couldn't. He couldn't show his face to them. And so he, they had a tabernacle, and then they built a temple. And what was put in place to block his presence from the people? A big curtain. Okay? Because anyone that looked at him just died. There's only one person that was able to stand in the presence of God and talk to him face to face. Who was that? The high priest. 
It was Moses. And do you know what happened to him when he would talk to God face to face? Really bright. <laughs> Literally. He turned into a walking flashlight. Okay? Whenever he interacted with God, the light of God actually made his face turn to light and shine. Could you imagine the fear of the people when he was coming down out of the mountain with the Ten Commandments with his face gleaming like a headlight from a car <laughs> in the dark? Okay? It says in the Bible that the people were so scared of him that even his closest friends ran away and hid when he was coming down the mountain because his face was on fire. Okay? Uh, and so <clears throat> what we have to realize is that God is light, but he has been separate from us all through the Old Testament, all through creation here after we fell. Okay? But now Jesus is coming. He's the Son of God. And He died for our sins. And what happened at the moment of His death? Oh, so the curtain was torn. Torn. Yes, the curtain was torn into two and opened. Okay? And so we, what we have to understand here is the good news is that we have to prepare, in fact, it's right here, prepare for a new concept or idea, okay? Because everyone thought that God was totally distant and separate. God is no longer distant and separate from us. Every man has now been given access to God or the locals or on light if they want, okay? And we're in this, the, this church age period is this period where we're on earth and every man, woman, and child has access to interact with the Spirit in different ways. The Spirit is pulling us towards God. Uh, it says that, that God loved the entire world that He gave His Son. And the, the Word has been given to us. In fact, the New Covenant... Um, the New Covenant is found a couple different places. The New Covenant basically says, I will put my, my laws on their heart and write them on their mind. Uh, and no one will have excuse, for they will all know God. Okay, so every one of us is learning about this light. It's this, this weird period where light and darkness are really kind of able to interact a little bit. Okay? But not... That's just a weird mystical thing. Okay? Alright, so what is the gospel? It is prepare for a new idea. We are no longer separate from God. We have access to God. And that is good news because God is life. Okay, without Him, we have death. But right now, we have access to life. And so it's very good news. We don't want to throw that away. Now, there's a word, since I've already put it up on the screen here, that narrows down what the gospel is in one word. So we have it in sentence form, which is repent for the kingdom of heaven is near. We have the gospel in one word. Okay? What is that word? Emmanuel. Emmanuel. Okay? What does Emmanuel mean? God with us. Yeah, I brought it way too early on the slide. Okay, I gave you the answer on that one. Okay, so uh, raise your hand if you know what the gospel is in one sentence. What is it? Repent for the kingdom of heaven is near. Okay, good answer. What is the gospel in one word? Raise your hand in the back there. Emmanuel. Emmanuel, which means? God with us. God with us. Okay? And so it may sound like a wimpy gospel, but it is not. The people that lived before Jesus Christ, they lived their whole lives striving for what we have. They gave their lives. They served God in faith 
without access to the light that we have. We don't know what it would be like to not have access to God the way we do now. Uh, to be able to pray and be heard uh, where he didn't hear the prayers of those in darkness before. He just, I'm not listening. Okay? All right, so let's continue. All right, the gospel is not something that we know about. It is something that we are able to experience. And we just have to realize this. When, when we have a broken gospel or a powerless gospel, our gospel relies on information about God. We don't want our gospel to be that. What we want our gospel to be is a reflection of God in us. So how do we have God in us? How, what does that look like? What are your thoughts? What does it mean to have God in us? What does it look like? Love. Love. So how, how do we love others? By sharing. By sharing. Okay, giving. Okay, giving when no one is looking. Uh, giving when it's not going to benefit us in any way. That's the hard one. It's easy to give when you get something back, right? It's easy to give when everyone's watching you and they lift you on their shoulders, okay? But to give when no one's watching, that's love. Um, just, yeah, it's just love in general, um, being holy, uh, acting the way God wants us to act. Uh, and it's things that we can't do ourselves. Uh, the fruit of the Spirit's a great example of that. Um, one of the fruit of the Spirit is called self-control. Who here likes that fruit of the Spirit? Okay. <laughs> self-control is a fruit of the Spirit. And so uh, without God, without any light, without any interaction, if there was a desire that a man had or a woman had, they would do what? They would just do it because it's a desire. And I'm going to do that. <laughs> Okay, it's like if there's a Snickers bar sitting there unattended, and it's open. Yeah, I mean, I'm going to eat that Snickers bar because I don't have self-control, right? Because I desire it. Okay, but the Holy Spirit comes into us, and a fruit of the Spirit is self-control, and all of a sudden we have self-control in different areas of our life. That's part of sharing the gospel. <coughs> Not being angry when we're supposed to be angry. Okay? When someone hits us, we want to hit them back. Okay? But the gospel fills us not to feel those ways. And we turn the other cheek. Okay? All right. No one can truly share the gospel without first receiving the gospel. Okay? A lot of people receive the powerless gospel of information, and they can share that until they're blue in the face. Okay? But you can't truly share the gospel until you've received the gospel. Now, John the Baptist was testifying about the light. And we've already talked about how in order to testify about something, you have to first experience it. Right? So, did he experience the gospel? Did he experience the light? Mm -hmm. All right, we're going to read about that. Okay, uh, John was the prototype of a man being dwelt by Logos, the fullness of God's holiness. Okay, this was in the form of the Holy Spirit. Okay, uh, before John the Baptist, people did not get filled with the Holy Spirit. Uh, in fact, in the Old Testament, they, there were judges and kings, and they would interact with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit would only interact with like five or six people at a time. Okay? And what he did, the Holy Spirit would go to someone that, needed to, that he needed to be with, like a king, and he would go upon that person. Okay? Uh, and what that looks like, uh, so that you can all kind of picture that, is picture 
if you took a, just a bucket of chunky peanut butter. Okay? Who here likes chunky peanut butter? All right, I, I don't like chunky peanut butter. Okay, if you took that chunky peanut butter and you wiped it all over your skin, okay? All over your head, all over your clothes, all over your feet, okay? Okay, you'd be covered in peanut butter. And that is the Old Testament picture of what it means to have the Holy Spirit come upon you. Okay, he was all over you. Okay, so when you'd walk around, people would be interacting with the Holy Spirit because, man, oh, I'm sorry, here, shake my hand. Oh, man, she got some Holy Spirit, I'm sorry. Okay, the Holy Spirit was upon the kings and the judges. Okay, and the reason that he was upon them was because Jesus had not come back yet, and, G and God, the light, had to be separate from the people. Does that make sense? Before Christ, God had to still be separate. So he had his Holy Spirit working, and he was on people, but yet not in them, if that makes sense. So when we get to the New Testament, now we get this shift. And John the Baptist, for some reason, before Christ's death, is the very first person that gets to experience what it was like to have the Holy Spirit not come upon him, but fill him, even from birth. Okay? And so this is a scripture, this is Luke chapter 1, verse 15. This is the angel that's talking to his dad that is uh, going to be talking about John the Baptist. This is what it says. For he will be great in the sight of the Lord. He will drink no wine or liquor, and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit while still in his mother's womb. Okay, so can you see that shift? Old Testament, the Holy Spirit comes upon like chunky peanut butter. New Testament, you are like a sponge that is immersed in the waters of the Holy Spirit. And every crevice in you becomes indwelt by the presence of God himself. Can you see the difference? All right. And that's good news, isn't it? Because here's the thing. God is life. I mean, he's eternal life. He's eternal goodness. And if he is in us, we will not die. Does that make sense? All right. Now, Jesus provided an example for us as well. Uh, this is Mark 1, verse 10. Uh, what we have to realize is that when Jesus came to earth, uh, before he came to earth, he was omnipotent because he was God. Amen? He was fully God and fully man. But when he was born in the womb of Mary, the scriptures say that he emptied himself. And that's really important. Because what he does through his whole ministry is he doesn't use his own godliness to do ministry. It would be really easy for him to do. Okay, If he wants to walk on water, he's God. He's just going to walk on water. But he doesn't do that. What he does is he emptied himself and he lived a pretty normal life and then he came to the river to be baptized by John. Jesus did no ministry before he was baptized by John. Okay? And what happened is he came and he went under the water and he came out and the Holy Spirit descended upon him. Okay, now, he didn't indwell him because he was already God. So I, it's almost like God, or Jesus kind of like turned on his Holy Spirit stuff. Because he didn't need to be filled with, with the Holy Spirit because he, he was already there. Okay, but the Holy Spirit came and descended upon him. And it's a beautiful picture of the Trinity 
where the Holy Spirit is there, Jesus is there, and the clouds open up, and God says, this is my son who I am well pleased. Uh, a great moment where the whole Godhead is right there. What a holy moment. Uh, but here it's where the Spirit is doing the same thing. God, or Jesus, did not share the gospel until the Holy Spirit came upon him. John the Baptist did not share the gospel until he could testify that the Spirit was within him. And that's important because if we're going to share the gospel, we can't share a gospel of information. We need to be able to share a gospel that we are experiencing. Does that make sense? If we have joy when we're not supposed to have joy, if we have hope when there's hopelessness all around us, that is going to be a gospel of power and not a gospel of information. Amen? Amen. All right. So, what is the uh, one word to share the gospel? Emmanuel. Emmanuel. I want you to remember this word. When you run into someone that you feel God wants to share the gospel with, you don't have to say, repent for the kingdom of heaven is near. They're not going to understand it. Repent! Do it. They're not going to understand that. But if you can explain the concept of God with us and why that's important, that is going to do much more in bringing that person to God. All right, we're almost done. What? Oh, well, I'm gonna, I'm gonna get there. It's gonna be better than that, though. I'm not, I'm not gonna do a 30 second me gospel. <laughs> That's not as fun. <laughs> All right. Sharing the information about God's plan of redemption is the least effective way of sharing the gospel. I want you to know that as a fact. Okay? People that win hearts to the Lord, most of them don't care about the plan of redemption that much in, in what they're sharing. Sure, it's important. Sure, it needed to happen. It's great information. But it is not vital at all in relaying the good news. Okay? Yes, we want to know it. If they ask about it, yes, we share. But we want to share the power of God in the message, not share how we got the message. Does that make sense? Okay. Uh, let's see here. We are called to allow the power of God to flow through us as light. Okay, John is talking about this light. And here's the thing. Jesus is light. And as we get through John, guess what? He gives this light to the disciples. And at the end of John, it shifts. And he, in his prayer, he wants the light. He prays for us to be able to receive the light from the disciples. Okay? It's all about this light thing. It's the power and presence of God. Okay? It is this love for others that is truly the most effective form of evangelism. So, uh, there's a, a famous pastor, I forgot who said it, but he always said, preach the word, and when necessary, use words. Okay? Our actions are super important with the gospel. Okay? Take this for example. Let's say uh, there's a person that we want to minister to the Lord with. Okay? Are we going to be able to minister to the Lord effectively if we're going bar hopping with them and we're getting totally wasted and doing bad things and we got divorced and uh, we, we just live a horrible sinful life? When we go to that person and say, Jesus is going to save you, he's the answer. Is that going to be an effective gospel presentation? It's not. Because they're going to see the brokenness and the shame and the guilt and the darkness in you, and they're not going to want that gospel. Okay? But I've seen it where uh, someone's been diagnosed with cancer and they're on their deathbed, 
and they've gotten a bum rap. And instead of being bitterness, bitter and broken, they're super excited and they're filled with love and they're filled with joy and they're trying to share about the glory of God and they're praising God's name. Okay? And that's the power of God flowing through a person as they have peace and joy. That is the gospel that we want to share. Amen? Amen. So what is the gospel of one word? Amen. What does it mean? God with us. <laughs> All right. This is the hard part. And uh, we are going to turn off the video recorder for this one. And so uh, uh, we'll have to, you'll have to come uh, to do this role play next time.